This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week, Sean Powers and I are talking with Steve Klabnik of Rust. It's a great show, and that's coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 618, recorded Wednesday, February 24th, 2021. Rust. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Melissa. Like expired milk, 30% of your customers' data goes bad every year. That's money down the drain. Visit Melissa's developer portal for free access to data quality APIs, demos, and code samples. Freshen up your sour data today with 1,000 records cleaned for free at melissa.com slash twit. Good morning, good evening, and whatever it is and whenever it is uh, to you, I am Doc Searles, and this here is Floss Weekly. I am joined this week by my co-host, Sean Powers. Uh, it's there me. he is. For those of you on video, there he is with his death ray in the, in the background. <laughs> so, 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 Sean and I, I think you and I are in absolutely opposite weather parts of the country right now. I'm in Santa Barbara, where it's warm. And you are still under snow, right? Somewhere. Yeah, I'm at the north. I'm at the North Pole. No, I'm in northern <laughs> Michigan. It's actually pretty warm today. It's it's uh, right around freezing, and uh, I mean it's shorts weather around here. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so our our guest this morning is uh, Steve Klavnik of Rust fame. Um, are you're familiar with uh, Steve and or Rust. Um, uh, Rust more so than Steve, but we talked with Steve a little bit, so I know Steve a little bit. I know that there, there's, an, there's a crated animal of some sort next to him, so stay tuned. It's true. It's my dog, although he's in the other room, so he won't be causing any problems for the recording. Uh, there's Steve. Ironically, the reason the crate is in this room is I'm in Austin, Texas, and so I've had both of your weathers oh, within wow. the last like three days because five days ago it was nine degrees, and today it is a breezy 81 of high today. So, uh, well, that, yeah, it's been wild. That must have wiped out the snow, I imagine, and or the ice. Yes, yeah. it did pretty quickly. So, so we're... Um, uh, we're going to go over some uh, some stories of the week. This is actually a new thing with us, so we're not fully adjusted to it yet. And we're going to start with one that Sean has um, from his own life. I think is that is that is that right, Sean? Man, I you know this is one of those cases where uh, fiction. I wish it was fiction and not truth, but um, yeah. So I had my my domain compromised recently. My my brainofshawn dot com domain. Yeah, well, I'm not uh, going to tell you about it. <laughs> okay, I wasn't sure whether we did the ad first or second. So okay, at this point, so we're still getting used to it. All right, we'll. I'll tell you what. Hold off on the story. This the sto- Sean's story is actually an awesome story. So um, let me uh, get my right tab up here and let you know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Melissa. Um, if you've ever forgotten to check the date on a carton of milk, you know what this is about. Like milk, your customer data goes bad. In fact, up to 30% of customer data goes bad every year. Melissa, make sure your data is accurate and current so you can reach the right customers. Their tools have helped businesses maintain fresh data for over 35 years. Don't throw money down the drain with bad data. Verify addresses, emails, phone numbers, and names in real time with Melissa. Melissa's Global Address Verification Service verifies addresses for 240-plus countries and territories at the point of entry. This ensures that only valid billing and shipping addresses are captured and used in your systems. Identify your customers and get to know them. Add consumer demographic information to your records, such as property and mortgage data, even marital status, or social media handles. Melissa's flexible deployment options offer different platforms to suit any preference, business size, or budget. With flexible on-premise, web service, secure FTP processing, and software as a service, or SaaS, delivery options, you can choose the best way to meet your unique business needs. Melissa continuously undergoes independent security audits to reinforce their commitment to data security, 
privacy, and compliance requirements. They have the utmost dedication to your data's security by implementing strong controls and safeguards when processing your data. SOC 2, HIPAA, and GDPR compliant as well. Over 10,000 businesses trust the address experts. Melissa is supporting communities and qualifying essential workers during COVID-19 as well. See if your organization qualifies for six months of free service by applying online. Don't put up with sour customer contact data. Try Melissa's APIs in the developer portal. It's easy to log on, sign up, and start playing with the API sandbox 24-7. Get started today with 1,000 records cleaned for free at melissa.com slash twit. That's melissa.com slash twit. Okay, so back to Sean and the disaster he suffered <laughs> recently. Something, was it of your own cause uh, there, Sean? You know, I'm, I'm not sure, and I won't go into too much depth, but it, it relates to my story, I, I, I promise. Uh, so my my registrar account was compromised. I don't know how. I'm not one to use the same passwords on multiple uh, sites or whatever, but somehow they got in and they changed the MX records on my domain. So they were getting all of my email and then they subsequently tried to reset passwords on every site, specifically financial sites, using the, I forgot my password, so email me a link to reset it and they were getting my email. So you can imagine it was a nightmare. Uh, but that really led into um, me telling everybody that would listen how important multi-factor auth or two-factor auth is because if just your email is the safety net, it's a really scary place to be. Uh, so uh, one, yeah, two-factor auth is important. Having smart passwords is important, which means that you can't have the same password on every website, even if it's a really good password, as I've heard people say. Um, so password managers are vital, and I've always been a proponent of uh, LastPass, uh, I've used it for years, and starting in March, now LastPass is kind of taking back some of the features they've been offering for years for free. It used to be that LastPass, originally, you could use the desktop app and it was completely free, but if you wanted to use the mobile part of it, you had to pay for a pro. And then they took that away and you could use both mobile and desktop for free without paying. Well, in March, that changes. In March, you have to decide between one, desktop or mobile. And I, I want to encourage everybody, that's a bad idea to just pick one. You should have access to your password manager everywhere because if you don't, you're going to make some poor password choices like, well, I'll just do this simple password so I can remember it. And Doc, you and I talked for, and we dedicated an hour of another podcast to it uh, about my story and, and where to go from yeah. here. But basically, uh, LastPass is changing. It's still a great password manager, but if you don't want to pay for a password manager, it might be a good time to consider alternatives out there. Uh, and there are a bunch. Yeah, I should uh, add that uh, LastPass has been a, a very good sponsor of, uh, of uh, Twit in the past. Um, so uh, hats off to them for helping us out for a long time. Um, I, I, I use Dashlane myself. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I, I, it's, it's, I think they're all good in their own different ways. Um, uh, I think, and they all change. I mean, as you're pointing out, I think they have value. I think they have enormous values. I think we, we actually need for these sure. kinds of things, kind of like you need to pay, you need to pay for the gas in your car. You don't get that for free either. So, um, you know that's uh, that's a good thing. Um, it, it, just to hurry through a couple other uh, another story or two. Um, one is the is of course a, a big hats off to Mars and to Linux being <laughs> used um, uh, in on Mars. There's for the first time the, the 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 rover, not the rover, but the thing the thing that flies, the helicopter thing has a store bought um, Raspberry Pi in it or something like that. Um, that's called COTS, COTS Equipment, C-O-T-S, which stands for Consumer Off the Shelf or something like that. Or, um, uh, commercial it's, uh, Off the Shelf, if I'm reading right Commercial now Off so, the yeah. Shelf, right, <laughs> right. Um, yeah, and so, you know, and there's also, you know, related stories. So just look this up. Um, that one was on MSN News, news but uh, SpaceX has also said they've launched 32,000 Linux computers into space for Starlink. And I think, by the way, that Starlink is going to be one of the biggest stories ever because they're, it's going to really bring the world um, 
uh, bring the world online. Uh, there's one more I, I'll just mention briefly, um, which is uh, on my blog. If you just go to doc.searles.com, first name at last name, dot com, it'll redirect to uh, my blog. And the the latest one there is called Welcome to the 21st Century. And I and it's it's kind of an, an insight I had, or kind of not less an insight, than just sort of an observation, which is the next century doesn't necessarily start when the the odometer rolls over, you know, at, at the end of the millennium as it did in 2000. Um, it may start later, or it may start earlier. Um, I, I read it actually, the, 20, the 20th century really began with the assassination of the Archduke Ferdinand and the start of World War I, and... So you wonder when did it end? I think it ended with COVID. I think it ended in 2020, um, and and I thought of that in part because if you uh, look at that one, I found an interview I did at a Linux event in 2004 that is just full of optimism for all kinds of things that are finally happening now. <laughs> you know, so um, I think it would have been pretty discouraged if at the time I thought that uh, it was going to take that long, but it, it's um it's anyway it's just something to think about. So anyway, that's uh, that's some news, and I want to I, I want to welcome our our, our guest Steve uh, Klabnik, and uh, who I think is the the primary author of Rust. Are you Steve? But you should just give your whole background there because yeah. I don't have something written down here. So give us totally. the story. It's it's long and complicated, but the the short of it is is that I am on the core team of Rust, and I co-authored the book that most people learn Rust from, to the degree that people in the Rust community call it the book. Um, it's called the Rust programming language, and it's sort of like the default manual to learn the language. Um, I'm not the original author of Rust, however, uh, I have been on the core team since 2014, uh, and since before the like. The entire Rust governance structure has existed for less time than I have been involved in Rust governance. Um, so, like, I've yeah. been around for a very long time at this point. Uh, Rust originally started in 2010 and then hit 1.0 in 2015. Um, so, uh, I've been on the core team since 2014 and got originally involved in Rust in 2012. So, I've been around for a lot of it. Um, yeah. So, I, I did see that in uh, in 2018. Uh, you said discover Rust, a C-like language that supports imperative, functional, and object-oriented programming. Um, is that a good description of Rust? Or good I enough? I think one of the things that's interesting is that Rust is kind of a little hard to describe, and that's basically because there, the way that I think about it is there's sort of like three major influences that are brought together. There is the systems programmers in the C and C++ kind of universe, and that's like a, a sort of a very core aspect of Rust. The next one is sort of like the functional group. So the original people who made Rust were big fans of OCaml, but we've gained some Haskell fans. We kind of have a little bit of that angle going on. And then finally, the Ruby, Python, JavaScript crowd has been a really big addition. And so you sort of kind of get those three major influences shoved into one language. So some people look at Rust and they see, oh, this is another C++. Some people look at Rust and they say, oh, this is another Haskell. Um, and so it really just like kind of depends. The way that we describe Rust is a, a programming language that is uh, designed for like safety and empowering users. So the, the, you can also look historically at how Rust was created. It was originally sponsored by Mozilla to improve Firefox. So uh, Mozilla, like Firefox is a like multiple millions of lines of code, C++ code base, and security vulnerabilities in particular are extremely severe. Uh, and are often caused by the fact that C++ is a sort of dangerous language. And so the idea was, what if we could make a language that was as fast and powerful as C and C++, but had a lot of the like inherent unsafety aspects sort of like fixed? Um, so I kind of compare it to like a, a power tool with some safety features. Like it's still a power tool, but it's not the same as like, you know, putting your hand into a bandsaw. Um, and so that's kind of like uh, the the sort of historical context. Um, but yeah. So I, I I have a litany of questions that I'll probably ask in an awkward order that uh, that won't make much sense. But first of all, so I, I assume that you were uh, connected with Mozilla. Is that not the case? So I actually started getting involved uh, before Mozilla, and then eventually I was employed by Mozilla for a while, and I left Mozilla a couple years ago. 
So uh, the answer okay. is all of the above, basically. Um, okay. Additionally, while Rust was stewarded by Mozilla for a significant portion of its life and is sort of often seen as like being a Mozilla-owned thing, uh, Rust kind of transitioned away from Mozilla being the primary role in governance a couple of years ago. And in fact, just recently we formed a Rust foundation uh, that is also like holds the IP and such. And so at this point is kind of like not divorced from Mozilla because they're also participants in the foundation, but like has not been, it has been sponsored by a large number of places, not just Mozilla for a while now, um, both informally and now formally. Okay. So that, that is kind of an answer to one of my, one of my questions. Uh, so it's no secret that Mozilla may be struggling as a company, right? I mean, they laid off a ton of people recently. Totally. Uh, and so that, that made me think, Oh, what does that mean for rust? Uh, Especially if you compare it, and I think one of the languages it's often compared to, and maybe fair, maybe not, maybe we can talk about that, is Golang, right? The Go language totally. that Google, I mean, Google's baby, right? Uh, but the difference, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, and, and I'm probably wrong in some aspects here, but uh, Go is largely, if not completely, uh, contributed to by Google. It's their baby. They do almost all or all of the contributions. But Rust is not necessarily that way as a relationship with Mozilla, correct? I mean, there are lots of contributors in GitHub and that sort of a thing. So um, I, I guess the, the yeah. question that I'm asking in a weird way is, if something bad happens to Mozilla, does that mean it automatically happens bad to Rust? Right. So um, I don't want to like wholly speak about Go since I'm not like a member of the Go community or project, but I will say that Google has a, a obviously a large influence on Go and people can argue how total that control is. Uh, I, I, I can't really speak to that super directly, but uh, Russ has sort of been an interesting place because uh, like we have a pretty large governance structure because we like steward a lot more than just the, the language of the definition. And so there were at the time of the Mozilla layoffs, for example, there were about 250 people that were involved in Rust governance and only about four or five of those were Mozilla employees. So like that just limits the amount of sort of like damage that if you snapped your fingers and Mozilla disappeared tomorrow, uh, you know, you would be talking about a very small number of people. Now, those people were doing very important work and I don't want to discount the amount, like those are my friends and colleagues, right? So I'm not trying to say that they're irrelevant or meaningless, of course. Uh, and Mozilla also did pay some significant bills that we had as a project. Like, you know, we distribute versions of the compiler and that S3 bucket is expensive. We have CI that we run on every single commit uh, and that is expensive. Um, you know, we have a website, all that kind of thing. And so they were sponsoring those bills until relatively recently as well. Um, however, for the last couple of years, those had been comped by various companies um, before the foundation formally got kicked off. So yeah, like for the last couple of years, uh, it would be painful if Mozilla just suddenly disappeared, but it would not be like a death threat to the Rust project. And I think especially now today, um, you know, uh, like their influence is relatively minimal. Um, obviously they still matter a lot. As I said, they're a member of the Rust Foundation, but uh, they don't currently employ any of the people that work on Rust uh, anymore. So, um, yeah. Okay. The fact that you don't work there anymore, I guess, kind of speaks to it, to that as well. Uh, so, so I'm going to compare a lot of, of things to Rust because honestly, um, my experience with Rust is very limited and that's part of the, the issue that I have. So totally Rust is, first of all, I have to say Rust is awesome, right? I mean, it's, it's performant. It, it makes you write good code because it won't compile. If you do something dumb, I, I think that's, that's probably not in the documentation, but it seems like a, a fair thing to say. It is a uh, feeling that people have. Even if I wouldn't say that's a guarantee, <laughs> that's definitely like an opinion and a sentiment that many people share about it for sure. Like you're not totally out of bounds to say that, even though anyone can argue about anything, right? Um, sure. <laughs> that's fair. Um, I think that when, when, so when I think about Rust in some of the few projects I'm involved in, like Filecoin is something I, my day job is to manage Filecoin or miners. The main l mining software is written in Go, but the very uh, fine-tuned performant part is written in Rust for obvious reasons, right? Uh, so I, I just, I think it's a, it's a powerful language, but I'm going to pick at you just to kind of get your response to if people ask me about it, what can I, what can I, say to them. And things like when I think of Rust, I compare it to C++ most in my head, right? I, I think of, you know, if we could reinvent C++ back however many years ago and say, instead of 
learning this thing called C++, let's learn Rust. I think that there would be far better uh, programs out there in the world, far better applications written. But I worry that Rust isn't better enough or doesn't offer enough to like rewrite code. Uh, you know, sure. sure, you could rewrite your C++ code and in Rust and it would be better, but I'm not sure if it would be better enough to go through that. So uh, where do you see the niche right now for Rust in that kind of an environment? I think that most people like think about programming languages like sports teams. And so they sort of assume like, you know, there is a winner and a loser and the loser goes away and the winner gets all the spoils. And that's how like software evolution works. But I don't think that's actually like accurate, really. I think that they're like over time, more things get written and the the pie grows for everyone. Uh, and so that's like a more productive way to think about language adoption. So, for example, it can be true uh, at the same time, for example, like if you looked uh, 15 years ago before Rust existed, um, 100% of the software maybe, let's just say for the sake of argument, is written C++ because, uh, you know, Rust didn't exist. Now, maybe let's say 10%, be extremely generous to myself, 10% of software is written in Rust and 90% is written in C++. That means that in some sense, Rust has grown and C++ has lost. But at the same time, like there are so many more programmers that exist in the world that C++ can have grown like because there's more software that exists, right? So I think that more, you won't necessarily see as many people like throwing away existing code bases and rebuilding them in Rust. But I do think that you'll see people increasingly faced with the choice of what do I use for my next project? And they will decide to choose Rust instead of C++ or whatever other thing they would have chosen. And that over time, those things will grow in importance. And so Rust's importance will also grow. There are some examples of things being rewritten, but I don't think that's like actually the majority or the way that like programming languages get famous, right? Like when Ruby on Rails became incredibly popular, uh, it wasn't because people threw out their Perl code and rewrote stuff in Ruby, right? It was a new generation of startups that decided to choose Ruby to do that. Um, and I think that's kind of how programming language evolution tends to work on a macro scale. It's almost like we planned this segue because <laughs> literally Amazing. on my little notepad here, I have a, a, the next thing I wanted to ask is how does Rust avoid being in the same boat as another four letter R language, right? Ruby, awesome. Everybody loved Ruby. And right now Rust is like the most beloved language uh, for several years running. Everybody loved Ruby, but it's kind of falling by the wayside. How does Rust avoid being that, shooting star that then, you know, fizzles out. I, I think it offers a lot of good things. And any of my questions, please don't think this is saying, I don't think you should do totally. Rust. I think Rust is awesome. I just want to know how we can make it, uh, you know, be the mainstream alternative to C++ languages or uh, get enough people to start writing libraries so that it can compete with things like Go, where there's lots of other libraries out there. Um, uh, get people to think, hey, maybe I should think more about, you know, garbage collection with, with my programming instead of just letting the automatic garbage collector, collect, collector hopefully do it right. So I guess I'm asking you these things mainly because I, I want to know how to help make it better, right? Or not better, yeah. more successful. I don't know. Totally. It's subtle. I, uh, <laughs> it's, I, I chose Ruby for a reason. And, you know, you said at the start you weren't super familiar with me. So maybe, the, you know, this is a thing, but it's just funny how the universe works sometimes. Um, I actually used to work on Ruby on Rails and Ruby before I did Rust stuff. I actually kind of left the Ruby world to come to Rust. So that's why I choose that when I choose examples, because it's one I'm like intimately familiar with. And, uh, you know, we could like analyze why Ruby on Rails is not as popular as it used to be. I still think it's a fantastic tool for people, um, but this is not a Ruby-related podcast. Um, I think that in terms of like gaining Rust adoption, the sort of next big step um, has been making it more public how much software is written in Rust today by some of the largest technology companies in the world and like making people aware that we're already in that state of things because like when you do make those decisions you know you have to choose uh what is like what level of risk is appropriate for you right like i don't know if you've ever heard of crossing the chasm that like pretty famous business book from the 90s i i really love that book 
Um, and I think that it makes a lot of sense even today. But basically, like, there's early adopters who are willing to put up with a lot of risk for a lot of reward. And then there's a significant chunk of people who are less risk tolerant um, and they want to use things that are more established. And so the question is kind of like, how does any new technology go from something that is like very new and risky to something that is well established that people can choose? And I think that to some degree, um, sort of crib from, uh, I think it was William Gibson, like the future is here, but it's une unevenly distributed. Uh, like, for example, uh, every invocation of an AWS Lambda relies on Rust code to work. Every time a Chromebook boots up, that requires Rust code to work. Uh, the password story uh, previously about LastPass, uh, I'm a one password user. Uh, part of the reason that I am a user of one password is they use Rust and that code, like every time I need to put a password into a website, Rust code is helping to make that happen. Um, and so like those stories are only sort of becoming broadly more known outside of the Rust community itself. Um, and like, so as those things happen, you know, people used to say like, why would I choose Rust? Because no big companies are using it. And I'd be like, Microsoft, Google, Apple, Facebook, like all of those companies are using Rust for real meaningful revenue generating projects. And that sort of de-risks it in people's minds because, you know, they have an investment. Um, and so, uh, yeah, like that's, I kind of think what, what sort of the next big thing is, is, uh, you know, knowing that things are, are big and useful and important and also, you know, more jobs, right? Like many people, while we like to do technology in our spare time because we're technologists and it's our hobby, for many people, it's also a job and you need to be able to do, use those technologies at your job in order to be able to use them effectively, right? So um, for me, that's kind of like the, the next big steps is like getting the word out there about how much Rust is actually used and therefore providing more ways for people to be able to use Rust at work. Oh, speaking of, uh, of Rust at work, you, you mentioned uh, last June that you took uh, a job at the Oxide com uh, Computer Company, which is, yeah. I guess that's what brought you to uh, Austin. Is that what that was? Uh, actually, uh, it was Cloudflare. So I I spent a year at Cloudflare before Oxide, and um, the Cloudflare job was what made me move to Austin. I lived in New York City before, and then I, I've moved a lot of times in my life. So, uh, I am from Pittsburgh yeah. originally, uh, but moved around a bunch and then this is why I'm currently in Austin. Uh, Oxide is basically remote friendly anywhere in the U S so, um, I could move anywhere and once COVID is over, we'll see if I decide to move again. Um, but yeah, totally. So at Oxide, we're building servers and we're writing all of the software from the firmware up in rust. So like my day job is writing firmware, mm -hmm. uh, and operating system level work in rust. Um, yeah. They must be happy to have you there. Uh, I, so, uh, speaking of, of working for a company, this is actually a topic that's been uh, much discussed here because uh, early on in the open source world, and bear in mind that the term open source has really only been in use since 1998, not sure. very long, actually. Free software more before that. But um, most of the alpha programmers were independent people and who were very much not working for somebody, or if they were... It was a side thing, and um, and but now that everybody, you know, open source is so nor so normative and so much embedded in what every everybody's doing. Um, if you're a serious company doing programming work, you have open source programmers working for you. Um, but and there's a question about influence, and so I'm wondering if you could see or want to talk about the 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 line that should be drawn between the stuff that gets developed because, geez, I discovered working for this company that this needs to be done with the, with the code. And that which, boy, I really want to work on stuff that's good for every possible application and not just the one for me. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that. Totally. I mean, this has been a thing for a very long time because, you know, as you noted, uh, you know, open source kind of came after free software and was pretty explicitly a way to make free software palpable for business interests, right? So we've sort of been dealing with corporate influence and in open source for 20 odd years. I can't do math that fast on my head. Um, <laughs> but like, it's true also that I feel like the tone has shifted in the last, let's say, five or 10 years. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with, similar to the programming language adoption, as open source has grown, we've grown the pie. And you see, like, if you pull an average open source developer today, I don't think they know that history of free software. And I don't think they know that history of open source. And I also think that's okay and fine. 
But I do think it's creating this interesting like kind of culture clash. I think that this often comes to head around specifically the like uh, the uh, I'm trying to think of exactly what the clause is called. The the no restrictions on use clause that's common to both the OSI definition and the FSF definition of open and free software, where like a lot of people who are involved in open source today. Uh, are kind of questioning that as a principle. I feel very conflicted about it. I don't. I don't have a, a strong opinion one way or the other right now. But um, I think that like one interesting aspect of this discussion is that to a lot of people, what open source means is not actually the FSF definition or the OSI definition. It's something else, and I'm not sure what that actually is. Um, I think that the root disagreement of what that is uh, comes down to the fact that like you know. Uh, Richard Stallman found that you could use copyright against itself, right? And the GPL was kind of this legal hack. But like software licensing is about how you consume the software. But what people care more about today is about how the software is produced. They want an influence in the direction of the way that software is made. And they care about like, can I affect changes upstream? Like uh, when companies like Apple, for example, do a source dump, Like the fact that you can download the source code of all of the stuff that they use because they need to comply with the licenses of that code, like that's sort of seen as like not actually truly doing open source, even though to the legal and like definitions of the historical like uh, licensing way of approaching open source, they're following the open source like license. It'll be sort of a cultural definition that's a little different than just like having an open source license, right? And so we don't really have a definition for like what is a production of open source? Like how does that matter? And like how does that work? And so that's kind of where my head is at on this question is we have a lot of people who are new. They're bringing a lot of new energy and opinions and that's super fantastic. But I think it's kind of like coming into conflict with a lot of very long held values for those of us who have been around a long time. Um, I've been around this space a lot older than it may like look like or seem like it feels like, uh, like I had a slash dot account with a five digit user ID. So like, I remember those days and I am part of these days now and they do feel different to me. And I'm, I'm not totally sure I have a handle on it yet, but I do think it's happening. Corporate influence is a large part of that for sure. So corporate influence that, that makes me think about so I, I work for a software development company right now I'm actually not a software developer that's a story that doesn't have to be on the show but um, one of the the issues is both leveraging contributing and uh, existing in the world where open source source software is so vital to everything we do um, and to bring it right back to rust uh, yeah if I were going to uh, look for a job to be quite blunt, there aren't a ton of we want a Rust developer job out there. Totally. And so I, I guess what, what I want to know is, is, is Rust something you think that people should uh, learn in addition to some other type of development? Should they, uh, do, you, do you wish people would just go all in and be a Rust developer and say, uh, you know, approach those companies looking for a C++ developer and say, I could do it better in Rust. Boom. <laughs> How do you see yeah. Rust developers paying their mortgages? Not yeah. just to be completely blunt. No, no, totally. I think that's, that is literally the question. And I think being blunt about it is the only way that you answer it, frankly. Um, so uh, what's sort of interesting is that in the past, there have been a lot of jobs that were like where people write a lot of Rust code at that job, but were never like... Rust is not put on the job requirement. So, for example, one of the earliest and like large companies that started using Rust in production was Dropbox, and they a uh, significant amount of Dropbox's core infrastructure is written in Rust today. Um, if you went to go apply for a job at Dropbox where you would be writing Rust code, it would not necessarily say requires knowing Rust on the resume, and the reason why is the population of people that knew Rust was not that big and they were willing to like train people into it. So they didn't want to make that a requirement. So there's this like weird chicken and egg aspect that we're still kind of going through that step where uh, many Rust jobs, you don't necessarily know that they're Rust jobs and they're not advertised as such. 
because like companies understand that with a smaller population of people who feel comfortable knowing Rust, um, that that would like limit the candidate pool in a way that they weren't feeling comfortable with. This is actually a thing that my company is actually going through right now because, like I said, virtually all our software is written in Rust. We're a little bit of JavaScript for the front end of the website because you know you need to do that basically. Uh, WebAssembly aside, it's a whole lot other tangent. Um, but like basically from the firmware up, we're in Rust. But we also acknowledge that you know we're willing to put in the time and effort to get people going on that front. Uh, and so, you know, uh, we're trying to balance, like, how much do you say this is a Rust job versus not? Because we don't want to dissuade people from applying because we're willing to get them to, you know, up to speed. Um, but at the same time, you know, you may not necessarily realize that that's the case. Um, and so I think that's that's part of it. As Rust is becoming more normal, it is becoming more usual for that to be the case. And so you see job postings specifically from Microsoft and Amazon and Apple that are expressly, uh, this is a Rust job because we are hiring for a Rust position. And so I think it's kind of a chicken and egg matter of time sort of thing. I think that if your primary concern is paying your mortgage, uh, you know, learning another technology, like it's undoubtedly true that there are infinitely more job openings for Java right now. Um, and so, you know, if there's other reasons, you know, you want to get a Rust job, it is true that there are less of them out there. It is also true that there's companies that are hungry for talent. And, you know, if it's a thing that you want to do, you can make yourself stand out and like go for those things. Uh, and I think that just like it's kind of a feedback loop, like as more of those stories become public and as more of those teams become public and as more of the job requirements include it, more people will want to learn it, which means there's a broader population, which means companies are more comfortable explicitly saying, like, we require Rust knowledge. Um, and I think that's kind of the, like, challenge right now. Um, yeah. So I'm, I think there's a uh, – there, there's an adjacent topic here, which is conferences. And you, uh, in your own exactly. writing, you talk about all the different conferences you – went to for a long time and how, you know, COVID has pushed this, it's kind of like it's pushed down the reset button, but hasn't released it yet. You know, yeah, so definitely. it's kind of like, we're all in the middle of that thing, where, you know, that, and when you lift your finger off it, then, then you see what happened. Um, and, and I'm wondering how you handle that now. I mean, I'm involved in a few conferences myself and everybody's improvising and there are some big advantages to doing it on, uh, Zoom or Zoom or the equivalent, and there are big advantages, obviously, to being there in person, and um, and so I'm wondering how you know because conferences of various kinds were, seem to have been a pretty big part of the Rust um, community. Uh, how how you're how you're dealing with that, and how it how you expect it to change when the the, the reset button gets released. Totally. Um, I'm not super 100% sure exactly because I feel like, you know, your point about COVID being like kind of this like before and after time, like you demarcate periods of time based on were you before or after the event. And I don't think we're like fully currently after. So I, you know, I can't super predict the future, but I do know that like most meetups and conferences are going fully online because, you know, people's safety is the most important aspect of things, right? And so it's sort of like, borderline unethical, maybe even actually unethical to hold a large in-person event right now. Um, you know, I want to be careful. Um, but you know, at the same time, like, you know, I have relatives that have died from COVID and so I'm not going anywhere. I used to travel, I did 250,000 miles on an airplane last year and I haven't let, left a four block radius of my apartment. And that was only to walk my dog cause he needs to actually be walked in the last year. So the world is a very different place at the moment. And so I think that out of necessity for the near term, things being online is just kind of the way that it is. Um, however, you know, humans are social creatures. And so I don't think that it will like totally completely uh, destroy the conference circuit, both broadly speaking and within Rust itself, um, you know, because there's, there's, uh, you know, it's, I don't want to say there's no substitute for, you know, person to person communication. Like I have made wonderful friendships online. There's many people that I, you know, like and enjoy their company that I've never been in the same physical place. And I may not even know their names, only their handles. Um, but, you know, there's got to be a balance and a mixture. And so um, I think, you know, for the sort of immediate term, Everything is online just out of necessity, and we'll eventually move back to some things being, uh, you know, in person. But, uh, you know, we just got to, like, figure out when that's okay for the first part of things. Um, yeah. yeah. We, we have a, um, a, a conference called the Internet Identity Workshop. It happens at the Computer History Museum every year, and or twice a year, actually. We've done 32 of them so far, I think, since 2005. It's about 300 people. Um and from all over the world, and it's been a pretty 
reliably um, energetic conference. A lot of great stuff has come out of it. Um, and um, we moved entirely online for the last two, and we'll do the next one entirely online. And it's much bigger now. It's actually bigger. Yeah. And people pay. They pay. They still paid the same amount. It was a cheap conference to begin with, so that's not that totally. hard. But here's the weird thing, and I'm wondering if you're facing this, uh, and that's why I bring it up. Um, already people are talking about, okay, we want to do it both ways. We want, mm -hmm. we, when we're back together, which, as you said, humans are sociable, uh, social creatures, um, we're going to still want that, the, the, the kind of, we want to leave the crumb tra kind of crumb trails we have and stuff like that in the online thing. We want to see a whole bunch of rectangles of people while we're with them. I want to look in in the other room while this is going on, that kind of stuff. And I wonder if you've given any thought to how that's, that may go. Because we, do, we don't have an answer yet. It's kind of like... Totally. Uh, yeah. What, one of the things that I actually miss most about physically attending conferences is I did a lot of it for like non-Rust conferences. So, uh, you know, maybe it's like some JavaScript people are interested in Rust and so a JavaScript conference invites me to come speak. And so I'm at that conference. But also there's a significant number of conferences that are... Uh, multi-technological, like they're not focused on a particular technology. And so some of my best conferences experiences have come from going to an event where, uh, you know, like let's just pick OSCON. I've only attended OSCON once, um, but it's, so I'm just going to choose it as a thing. But like stumbling across people who are from technologies I never would have met before and like running into those people at lunch, you know, sitting down at a random table of folks and being like, hey, everyone, I have no idea who any of you are. Like, what's going on? And those kinds of like connections, uh, you know, are a thing that's sort of missed. Uh, as a speaker at some online conferences, like I basically show up for my half an hour, talk to my computer, and then go back to work or whatever. Whereas the in-person events had a lot more of like random intermingling because, you know, I may be on a totally different side of the planet than most of my friends. And so I'm like hanging out with a crew of people that I have not really hung out with. And those kinds of things are really productive and interesting, both personally and professionally. And so, you know, that's kind of, I think, one of the things that's sort of kind of missing for me anyway. You know, maybe I should be in the chat rooms more often, or maybe it's my fault for not joining the like social space Zoom call that happens when it's not my talk or whatever. But I haven't found that affordance to be as easy as it is in an in-person conference. And so, you know, I think that's uh, a big part of it. And it's true, it's also a spectrum, right? So like, if you're at a conference where the it's a large enough conference, that the keynote room can't hold everyone. Like, uh, you know, I was at, um, uh, uh, why am I totally drawing a blank on this? QCon. Like QCon is large enough now that the keynotes have five rooms and some people are in the room with the actual speaker and other people are watching the live video feed of the keynote speaker. And like that's halfway to a remote conference already, even though, you know, you're in the same physical location to some sense. You're also not just because you're in the same building doesn't mean you're in the same room. And so I think we'll just see growth in all of these gradients of different kinds of things. And, uh, you know, I think it's opened some people's eyes to the possibility of what non-in-person conferences could be like. But I think it's also made a lot of people nostalgic for the days when we could be all in person. And so I don't think anyone wins or loses here. I think it's just going to be different. So talking about web conferences actually made me think of one of my questions. But uh, in the in the uh, Twit Live chat, people have been talking about some other languages, uh, specifically like JavaScript and, and Python. Uh, and that pointed towards my question. I... And my question was going to be uh, originally: Will you please dispel the idea that Rust is the is a great uh, web development language right now? I, I've I've read that you know it, it works, and there's some frameworks you can do web development with Rust. But it just seemed to me that the strengths of Rust uh, were not strengths that we really needed. I mean, it's kind of like putting a V12 engine in an 82 Chevette, right? I mean, it's like super performant, but all the I/O on the web is going to make it a, a moot point. But then. <laughs> But then there's more. I was thinking, okay, so if we are going to do more and more things online, even after the pandemic is over, uh, is is there room for some extremely performant, uh, memory safe type uh, web applications that Rust might actually be a a, a great solution for? Uh, and and if so, is that is that kind of what the the blog articles I've read about, like we should be using Rust for web development? Is it that sort of a thing, or is it just trying to make Rust uh, uh, a viable solution for lots of problems? 
I think it's complicated and also changes, and I have changed my personal opinion on this over time. So if you'd asked me five years ago, I would say, why would you ever use Rust for a web backend? Um, however, uh, my current company is actually doing that, and my opinion has shifted to the fact that it can make sense. I don't think it makes sense for everyone, um, and I don't even think it'll necessarily make sense for the majority of people. However, um, one, one interesting way to think about this problem is uh, – like now that we live in a world where we rent computers and possibly even parts of a time of computers, performance directly equals the bottom line. So like uh, as an example, our package management uh, like system, the back end of it is written in Rust and it runs on Heroku just like a Rails app might or whatever. Um, it uses about 30 megabytes of RAM resident at all times. Now it's not a big and giant super complicated web app, but like it costs 30 megabytes of RAM to spin up a Ruby process and like usually two or 300 megabytes to spin up a Rails process before you've even done a whole bunch of other stuff. And you know, 200 versus 20 megabytes is not necessarily that big of a deal, but if you're paying for thousands of EC2 machines and the lower resource usage of a language like Rust lets you shut a bunch of those down, that can directly translate to your bottom line. Now, maybe you don't care about that, and that's also totally super reasonable, but we've seen some companies adopt Rust in these contexts where you may not initially think it's useful because you're sort of only considering the perspective of like, as a programmer, what is going to enable me to ship this feature fastest? Um, and that's definitely a valuable perspective and is often the right one, but also at the same time, you know, businesses have to make money and that can sometimes mean increasing the top line with new features, but it can also mean, you know, reducing the bottom line by cutting costs. And so I think that, uh, you know, sometimes resource usage really matters because it directly turns into dollars now more than ever before. And so you, you see Rust popping up. Um, there is a big, large company that you have heard of that I can't really talk about who they are because they did this is not a public sort of thing. But they rewrote some Python code that was running on every single one of their web servers in Rust and were able to decommission enough of them to save millions of dollars a year. Like, and that would maybe make sense if you're a giant company. It makes no sense if you're a 10-person startup, right? So I think also this question, you know, people talk about what is the right tool for the job and whether or not Rust makes sense for you as a web backend, I think really depends on who you are and why, you know, you want to do it. Um, performance is not the only reason to choose Rust. A lot of people, you know, also like various other features um, and, you know, find that it makes expressing business logic and not causing bugs uh, to be helpful, but it is true that it's also like difficult to learn. So there's sort of the question about like, you know, is it worth the time investment to learn the language? But like once you do, you know, I am obviously an outlier. I've been programming Rust, Rust longer than most people, but like assuming that packages exist to help me get my task done, I'm like as productive in Rust as I am in Ruby now. Um, I don't think that will be true for everyone. I think that anyone that exists that like I can just hire a contractor and tell them to do that is lying to you. But I do think there are times when it can make sense, um, if that makes any sense to you at all. Um, so like, I, I, yeah, I have a, a question which um, is from the back channel in my own head. It's only because a note I made earlier. What is it that makes C++ dangerous? So fundamentally, like when I say dangerous, what I mean is uh, – C and C++, like, there's, a, there's an old joke that uh, C++ is not just a rocket launcher, but it's a rocket launcher that's already been pointed at your feet with the safety off. Like, uh, you know, sharp tools are valuable, but you only give sharp tools to master craftspeople because uh, there is a lot of danger in doing damage with, uh, you know, powerful tools. And so you can kind of, like, uh, you know, uh, specifically the way in which C and C++ are dangerous. And what we mean by that is if you as a programmer make a mistake, you can cause serious security vulnerabilities and or like serious problems in the way that your program works. So like um, I never know what level of detail to go into this, but like basically like C and C++ kind of let you do absolutely anything at any time. And that means you as a person have to be careful to double check that you are only doing the right things and not the wrong things because it will let you do the wrong things and then happily follow through with them and then bad stuff happens. And and Rust is kind of more, like the Rust compiler is sort of more like OSHA or like those power tools that have guards around the razor blades, you know, where like 
it will let you do the same amount of cutting uh, if you want, but it will also like try to help make sure that you know you only chop off your arm if that's what you're trying to do. I think maybe that got a little darker than I intended. But like specifically to, to maybe make it a more specific concrete example, um, they did an internal audit of Firefox uh, at one point in time. It's been a couple years old now. But like uh, over half of these serious security vulnerabilities, the like I visit the wrong web page and some JavaScript steals my credit card information kind of vulnerabilities came due to the fact of misuse of the language itself. Um, and so, you know, that's why Mozilla had an interest in fixing that problem. So can we create a programming language where those kinds of mistakes are caught by the compiler and the tooling rather than by, you know, the hacker, uh, that we have to fix later. And so that's kind of, when we say dangerous, what we mean is like, you can cause arbitrarily bad things to happen easily. Um, if that makes I, any you know, sense. I like your analogy, actually. My analogy was going to be, and this dates me, but do you remember the movie, the Steve Martin movie, The Jerk? Where he got the fork with the cork on the end, so he couldn't. I think that anyway. I saw it as a child. I, I'm 35. Yeah. Thanks so for that. I think that's like right on the area of yeah, totally. Where I think I yeah, remember I seeing that, but I don't remember the plot super well. <laughs> but yeah, so um, that's actually good. And somebody mentioned in the in the back channel, and I'm so sorry, uh, who I don't see who it is, but uh, the idea that with Rust there would probably be fewer bugs. Because, one, the compiler won't let you leave a lot of um, boneheaded bugs in there. Uh, but that also will potentially decrease cost if there aren't bugs to, uh, you know, hunt down later. You know, I mean, they're not going to make it into running code because it won't let you do it if you do something particularly stupid. So even though uh, Rust is more difficult to program with, and, and I, I started like a coding tutorial. It is, it's tough. I mean, uh, compared to other languages, especially um, other modern languages, it, it's tough, right? I uh, compiling, getting things to compile is almost like a small victory in and of itself sometimes. Um, but once it compiles, there's inherently going to be fewer bugs and maybe that'll lower the, the bottom line from companies. And maybe that's a, a reason to adopt Rust on top of the issues like being more performant and, and you know, more precise with memory usage and that sort of a thing. Yeah, this is what NPM found. Um, NPM at least did use Rust in production. I haven't talked to them in a couple of years, so, you know, I'm assuming that things are still going fine, but uh, it's been a minute. But, like, they uh, rewrote their authentication service in Rust, and they did that. It took them a little while. They shipped it, and then, like, a year and a half went by, and they, they said, wait a minute, we haven't had like any problems with this service. Like a lot of our existing services have weird bugs and outages and like memory problems and like just in general, like are a little unreliable at times. Um, but like Rust is, ends up being extremely boring for them because like once it worked, it worked reliably and just kind of like sat there and was never the problem. They didn't like think about it again for a long time. And so, you know, again, everything's a trade off and it does require an upfront investment to some degree. Um, but like, you know, once you've made that investment, it's entirely possible that like you spend more time up front, but then you spend no time on the back end. Whereas, you know, like as someone who like I, I have a I have a Ruby tattooed on my body, probably can't see it because of the <laughs> camera and stuff. But like I did a lot of Ruby code. And you know what I did when I wrote web, web apps? I spent a lot of time fixing bugs after I thought the feature was done. And we as humans are bad at thinking of, like we only think about the time from like, I sat down to write the code to like, I committed it to production, but we don't take into account all the bugs that happen on the back end when we think about how long something actually took. And so something like Rust feels like it takes a long time because it's all up front and there's like not very much debugging. Um, like I didn't break out a debugger with Rust until I started writing firmware. I still use a debugger when I'm writing firmware because you know, it's a little, it's a little difficult. Um, but like, uh, you know, I spend significantly less time debugging my Rust code than I have in any other language that I've ever used. And for some users, that will be very valuable, um, regardless of the performance or whatever other aspects of things. So we're getting down toward the end of the show here. And, uh, but first I, I want to say that, um, there was going back in time, there was a, a really great book written by, um, Neil Stevenson, the novelist, but it was the, probably his only work of nonfiction called In the Beginning Was the Command Line. <laughs> and um, and at that time, Linux was still novel. It was like in the late 90s. Um, and he called Linux the, the whole hog of operating systems, but the whole hog is H-O-L-E, and hog is spelled H-A-W-G, I think. And it was a Milwaukee Tools 
instrument that should only be used by a qualified construction worker because all it did was drill big holes and it did it so aggressively that you had to be really muscular and hold on to it while you're doing it. And uh, so your, your, your comparison to tools kind of brought that to mind. I'm really hoping that Neil, and I've asked him, you know, this is my entire history with him, is please update that book. But I don't know if he's going to do that or not. So we, we end the show uh, traditionally with, um, with, with some questions. The first is, um, we haven't asked that you would like us to have asked um, and, you know, and then we'll go into another couple. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think something that I maybe expected you to ask, but you did not, is what role, if any, does Rust play in the Linux ecosystem today? Uh, and maybe that's slightly hmm. self-serving because I think that's another story that a lot of people don't realize. Uh, and in fact, it's kind of been a sort of a thing this week specifically, too. Um, but I don't know if that's I don't know if I get to ask my own question and then answer it or if you have to. Please okay do. My no, that's the idea. Yeah. So, uh this has been a big topic for a long time, and it turns out actually that uh, Linus has okayed Rust code to enter the kernel tree. Now, Ooh, not being wow. in the kernel itself, but like he basically said, if you can, I, I would, if I could find a compelling way to write drivers in Rust, I would. I am not categorically against it. He was famously categorically against C++ entering the kernel tree. And so a lot of people said he would never, ever accept Rust to be possible. And so it's not a guarantee and it's not even a thing that's happened today. But like he has said, I'm willing to entertain the idea. So there's been a lot of recent Linux maintainers conferences where they've been talking through the plan about how to make that happen. And so, you know, we may see Rust uh, enter the kernel in the next five, ten years, let's say. Um, and so that's going to be a very interesting development when that happens. Um, the second one is specifically this week, there's actually been a lot of discussion because a number of programs that are significant to Linux distributions are now gaining a Rust requirement. And that's causing a lot of distributions that had not previously packaged Rust to have to deal with that whole situation. And so specifically, uh, a PIP, the Python package manager, uh, has now gained a Rust dependency. And like distributions like Gentoo rely on Python for their entire build system. And so the Gentoo maintainers woke up this week and found that their operating system now has a sort of hard Rust dependency. And that's caused a little bit of consternation and some discussions to happen, to use my politics voice. Um, and so I think we're only mm -hmm. going to see this increasingly happen. Once Firefox gained a Rust dependency, many distributions started packaging Rust, and we've sort of worked through those with the Rust project and Linux distributions. We've tried to, you know, help out and, like, work on those things. But I think that that's one area where, uh, you know, your audience is probably going to start seeing Rust significantly more as Rust works its way into software that Linux and Linux distros depend on. It's going to become more of a reality for many folks. Um, so, Yeah. Well, those are great. Um, uh, so second to last question, <laughs> do you have any, and this is our control question. Uh, uh, we ask everybody this, is there anything you have to say about blockchain, including nothing? Um, I will say that I am historically intensely skeptical of blockchain. Um, there are a lot of rust stuff being done in the blockchain space and I am excited that people are using Rust for things that matter to them. It does not matter to me personally. Yeah, there's a there was a good piece I read this morning that um, a, a, a botnet is busy maintaining uh, 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 is busy maintaining it itself with that. And my screen just went blank, so I'm going <laughs> to go from memory here. I don't know why it suddenly says loading photos, <laughs> whatever that, that means. Uh, random stuff. Hard question. Um, Loading photos. I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like... Uh, There's I, a bug. It's like this program I was did, written I don't know what it was I did. So yeah, I'm back now. Anyway, so um, uh, finally, what's your favorite text editor in scripting language? So I have long been a Vim user. However, uh, I recently have converted to VS Code with the Vim plugin because honestly, I am not a Vim enough wizard. Like they've implemented enough of Vim inside of VS Code that it works for me. And so to me, they're like roughly equivalent. And there's some niceties about VS Code that I enjoy, but I like, I think of myself as part of the Vim tribe. 
Um, and scripting language, it still definitely is Ruby. Um, although I will say I've enjoyed JavaScript more in the last couple of years than I had previously. Um, but uh, Ruby is literally tattooed on my body. I do have a Perl camel tattoo as well, but I haven't written Perl in probably 15 years at this point. So uh, I would say those have to be number one and two. So, is, so I have to ask, is do you have the... the the, the, the Ruby uh, jewel, or do you have the word uh, or the both? gem or need itself? You yeah. have the gem. It's, it's a, right oh, there. <laughs> I can't a a pearl would be harder yeah. to do, I would think. You know, <laughs> I have the camel, the pearl camel. It's my whole sleeve is oh. Egyptian themed, and so both a camel and a gem work into that art style. And so I put them there for the programming reasons, but you wouldn't necessarily know that they're programming language specific tattoos. That's awesome. However, I have showed well, the person who made Ruby the Ruby tattoo, and I have shown the person that made Pearl the Pearl tattoo. So that's also an accomplishment. That's another great part of the <laughs> conference circuit is you get to meet your heroes. Um, so, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Wow. Um, okay, well, this has been fantastic. It's been a sh the hour has gone very fast. Um, it may be more than an hour at this point. So okay. uh, thanks so much, Steve. This has really been terrific. Uh, one of thanks our best shows, it's I would say. Great, yeah. And we'll have to have to have you back as things as things evolve. Totally, I'd be happy to. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, Sean, <laughs> that was a good one, huh? It was. I, you know, I, and Doc, it's funny. At the beginning of the show, I started to feel like, oh, oh, Doc is the host, and I've just just been like hammering questions and hammering questions. <laughs> so, I'm sorry about that, but I, I really I wanted to know a, a lot of things. Uh, uh, so, yeah, no, totally. I, I really liked the show. It was great. So. It's great to get a lot of questions. I would much rather have too many questions than not enough, right? Like a podcast is good if we're constantly talking and it's bad if we don't know what to say, right? So lots of questions is good as far as I'm concerned. Well, this is great. And um, uh, and a, a, I, I know because you're a writer as well, uh, uh, Steve. Some people, and I'm not one of them, can speak in final draft and um, – and I admire that. I mean, a lot of what you had to say, I think if we were to transcribe it, which is not something we do, but um, that would be, you know, you'd be, you'd make sense. <laughs> you'd make full yeah, sense. Yeah, I appreciate it. I, I tend to go through very long periods of not knowing what to say at all and then having a reasonable final draft come out. I'd say it's probably about 80% as good as if I did some editing afterwards or whatever, but uh, I have long periods of nothing. Like when I wrote the Rust book, it's like 540 pages long. The way that I wrote that book was like two weeks of nothing and then one day of 40 pages and then two weeks of nothing and then one day of 40 pages. Luckily, my co-author is a fantastic editor. And so she, you know, helped make that more than just a literal final draft. But, um, you know, we work together very symbiotically in that in that sense. Uh, she loves to edit. and I love to write. So we're a great team. Um, but, uh, yeah, I've also had the advantage of doing this since 2012, 2014. I've had a long time to refine these words. So, you know, I've, I've had much more practice than, uh, you know, things may seem. Well, thanks. Um, so, so Sean, because we're running short on time, uh, any plugs before we go? We saw Brain no, with just, Sean up earlier. Uh yeah, so uh, that's my YouTube channel, my, my Twitter handle, brainofshawn.com is my website. But um, rather than a plug, I just want to tell people, use a password manager. Uh, you know, I, I use LastPass. Uh, I love don't LastPass. Don't be like this guy. Uh, yeah, don't be like me. Uh, but yeah, use a password manager or the 1Password or LastPass or Bitwarden I love or one of the, um, one of the key pass based databases where you keep track of the database not in the cloud. Whatever it is. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> on that website was a picture of the safe I got because now I'm like writing down certain passwords and keeping them in my fireproof safe. Yeah. Be safe. That's, that's yeah. my... Yeah, don't my put them on stickies on your desk. Um, Do not. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Sean, and thank you, Steve. This has been another Floss Weekly. Um, next week, Dries Beitart himself, the inventor of Drupal and uh, the, uh, the, the guy who started Aquia, which is a huge company now. Um, great guy. Uh, it'd be really great to have him on. Um, uh, Catherine Druckmann, who's my co-host on that other podcast, is going to be here as a as a uh, as a co-host as well, because she knows so much, and as does he, of course, it's his invention. So um, that's scheduled for next week. So thank you very much. I'm Doc Soros. This is Floss Weekly, and we'll see you next week.
If you like Android with a heavy dose of fun and entertainment, then you're going to love all about Android. It's me, Jason Howell, along with my co-hosts, Ron Richards and Florence Ion. Every Tuesday, we discuss the news items that matter most, the hardware and devices that are running Android, and the apps that run on top of them. Plus, we answer your email each and every week. That's all about Android on Twit.tv.